Good morning and warm welcome to morning prayer today on Tuesday. Today the church remembers John Donne, priest and poet. He was born into a Roman Catholic family in London in 1572. His father, an ironmonger, died when Don was four. After periods of study at both Oxford and Cambridge, he came down without a degree and began the study of law at Lincoln's Inn in 1592. About two years later, he relinquished the Roman Catholic faith and conformed to the Church of England possibly in order to qualify for a career in government service. But whatever his motives, Don took his newfound Anglican faith seriously. In 1596 he joined the naval expedition led by the Earl of Essex. On his return to England in 1598 he was appointed Private Secretary to Sir Thomas Egerton, Lord Keeper of the Seal, and in 1601 he secretly married Egerton's 16-year-old niece, Anne Moore. This lost him his job and earned him a short period of imprisonment. But in a few short years he had turned from a debauched and sceptical youth into both a faithful husband and a man of faith. During the next few years, Don made a meagre living as a lawyer. A book he wrote in 1610 encouraging Roman Catholics to take the oath of allegiance to the king brought on to the notice of James I, who may have suggested that he consider a career in the church. Certainly he was appointed as royal chaplain a few months after his ordination in 1615. He continued to write poetry, but most of it remained unpublished until 1633. In 1617 his wife died, and in his bereavement, Dunn turned fully to his vocation as an ordained minister. From 1621 until his death, he was Dean of St Paul's, and with a growing reputation as a preacher, drew large crowds to hear him, both at the cathedral and at St Paul's Cross, the nearby outdoor pulpit. Largely forgotten by the century after his death, Dunn's reputation was restored in the 1920s when Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot opened, openly acknowledged their literary debt to him. Today he is rec recognised as one of the greatest of the 17th century metaphysical poets, many of whom, like George Herbert, were influenced by his work. Unlike George Herbert, however, Dunn wrote both sacred and secular poetry and his main themes of human love and divine love remain ever relevant as demonstrated in this extract from Holy Sonnet. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend. But I am betrothed unto your enemy, divorce me, untie or break that knot again, take me to you, Imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, shall never be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. If you should like to follow morning prayer, you can do so in the daily prayer book. We begin on page 238, and the psalm set for this morning is Psalm number 36. So let us pause and remember and recognise God's presence with us wherever we are. and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn. 
and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Psalm number 36 Sin whispers to the wicked in the depths of their heart. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They flatter themselves in their own eyes that their abominable sin will not be found out. The words of their mouth are unrighteous and full of deceit. They have ceased to act wisely and to do good. They think out mischief upon their beds and have set themselves in no good way. Nor do they abhor that which is evil. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness stands like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, shall save both man and beast. How precious is your loving mercy, O God! All mortal flesh shall take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They shall be satisfied with the abundance of your house. They shall drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to those who are true of heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, nor the hand of the ungodly thrust me away. They are fool, they are they fallen, all who work wickedness. They are cast down and shall not be able to stand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from St Paul's letter to the Hebrews. And what more shall I say? The time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God provided something better for us, 
that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We continue in Mark Oakley's book, My Sour Sweet Days, reflecting upon the poetry of George Herbert as we seek to grow in deeper relationship with God during this season of Lent. Today's poem is entitled The Glance. When first thy sweet and gracious eye vouchsafed even in the midst of youth and night to look upon me who before did lie, weltering in sin, I felt a sad, sugared strange delight, passing all cordials made by any art, the dew embalm and overrun my heart, and take it in. Since that time, many a bitter storm, my soul hath felt even able to destroy, had the malicious and ill-meaning harm, his swing, and sway, but still thy sweet original joy sprung from thine eye did work within my soul, and surging griefs when they grew bold controlled and got the day. If thy first glance so powerful be, her mouth but opened and sealed up again, what wonders shall we feel when we shall see thy full-eyed love? When thou shalt look us out of pain, and one aspect of thine spend in delight, more than a thousand suns disperse in light in heaven above. In his poem Love 3, Herbert finds himself in the presence of God, but because of a sense of shame and unworthiness, he says to God, I cannot look on thee. In this poem, the glance, it is instead God's look that is the focus. The poem begins with the poet speaking to God and remembering when God's sweet and gracious eye first cast itself lovingly on him, looking in on him at night like a devoted parent, looking out and over him through his youth, even though that youth was spent weltering in sin. Weltering means wallowing through mud and calls to mind the prodigal son parable where the son ends up in the pig's mud while the father is endlessly watching out for him to return home. When he sees God's watchful care over him and understands how cherished he is by his maker, Herbert feels a sugared strange delight better than any medicinal drink might bring. This wonder and delight falls on him like dew, anoints and flows over him. His heart is taken in, given shelter and joy, such that life becomes refreshed. The imagery here may have overtones of the baptismal waters when we are taken into the water and into God's compassion and delight. Herbert continues to talk about his feelings. Since that time, he says, many a bitter storm has come his way, and he might even have been destroyed if evil had its way with full control, swing and sway. It didn't, though. The original joy that was placed in his heart by God's tender and loving look never left his soul. So when surging griefs threatened to overwhelm, remembered love controlled and restrained the chaos, 
Indeed, joy appears to be one of the infallible proofs of God's existence for Herbert. If, continues Herbert in reflective mood, God's loving glance is so redeeming and restoring to human beings as they make their way through life's difficulties and ride the waves of emotions that make or break them, then imagine what it will be like to be looked on with full-eyed love when we pass from this earth. St Paul's reflection to the church in Corinth similarly reinforced the truth that here we see God only partially through a glass darkly. But there will come a day when we see face to face and know God as much as we are already known by him. The end of the last stanza is particularly beautiful. Herbert looks to the time when God will look us out of pain, when being seen and seeing that glance which reveals just how much we are wanted and treasured will dissolve all our hurts and griefs. All pain will disappear as love is fully reciprocated and understood. It will be more glorious and joyful than the light created by a thousand suns. Herbert's Christian journey was made with a very strong conflict felt within between the bitter storm and surging griefs he experienced and the sweet original joy that had centred and shaped his life and his relationship with God. One could argue that the honest tension between these is the source of his poetic creativity and lasting appeal. It is sometimes said that religion is lived by people who are afraid of hell, and spirituality is lived by people who have been through hell. His ability to live through the darkness while searching for the light gives him that doubled awareness which furnishes the faithful longing soul and makes it a good and indispensable friend to the rest of us. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. You are the God of my salvation. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I hope all the day long. O my God, in you I trust. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets God promised of old, to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And so we continue in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, as we gather before you this morning, 
we thank you for the gift of this new day. For the gift that we've been given to become more self-aware, more understanding as to who we are and where we are in our faith journey. We thank you for the gift that you guide us, walking alongside us as we discover ourselves and you. Keep us to this discipline, that though we are in the midst of adversity, we may continue to grow in faith and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we pray for the world, we pray for those very poor communities that are struggling with the isolation program, causing people to go hungry. We pray, O oh God, that you may give wisdom to the leaders of the nations, so that they may find new creative ways to support the most vulnerable in this world, and that in doing so, they may learn something of your presence in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all health organisations throughout the world, seeking to care for those who are sick, placing themselves in harm's way for the sake of others. May this be an example to us all as to how to love. We give you great thanks for our own National Health Service and all those who seek to support it. We pray especially for those coming out of retirement in order to help in whatever way they can. We pray for all doctors, nurses, scientists and med medical staff that you may keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for the church. Pray for Justin, our Archbishop for Pope Francis, for Sarah, Bishop of London, for Graham, our area bishop, for Jenny, our area dean, and for Father Nicholas, rector of our parish. We continue to pray for all members of our parish and congregation as we seek to reach out through the Taking Care programme. Help us to care for one another, as is your will. We pray especially today for those people who live, usually work, visit or pass through Cadogan Place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for 
all those who are struggling with isolation. Those who suffer from mental health issues. Those who are lonely or bereaved or feel forgotten. We pray for those who have been deeply affected by the coronavirus. Especially we pray for those who have recently died. And those families left behind. We place into your loving and healing arms, Graham Wilson. And ask you to surround his family with your love and assurance of the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In a moment of quiet, we lay before you, O God, all of those other people and petitions on our own hearts at this time. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Trusting in the compassion of God, we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May God, our Redeemer, show us compassion and love. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is good to be able to worship. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, with each and every one of you, and I hope you'll be able to join Father Nicholas later this evening at six o'clock for evening prayer and benediction. Have a blessed day.